Good evening and good day, everyone. Welcome to episode 18 of Ask Abhijit. Today is the Astrophysics Space and Universe special. I hope you're doing well. So, and uh, as always, you have asked many very interesting questions. So, let's start with the questions right away. And question number one is a very good question. In which direction did the Big Bang happen? So this is a question I believe that all kids would have, all uh, new students of physics would have about the Big Bang Theory. I'm sure I must have had this question when I was a kid. And this is a question that no teacher essentially answers. They discourage you from asking questions. And that's why this question remains with us for the, for the remainder of our lives. So in what direction did the Big Bang happen? So let's understand what this Big Bang was. So according to the best theory of the universe that we have, the so-called Big Bang Theory, the universe began as an extremely compact and extremely small point. Just one small point, infinitesimally small. All the mass and energy of the universe was concentrated in that point and it expanded from that. So it's not an explosion, it's an expansion. What is the difference between the two? An explosion is something that happens in one place, like a cracker bursting or a grenade blast. So it, it is something that happens in one place and it ejects material in all directions. So if the Big Bang was an explosion of the universe, you would find bits and pieces of the universe being flow, thrown out in different directions. That's not the case. The universe is just one. It's one single entity. So it was a very rapid expansion, an incredibly, humongously, ridiculously rapid expansion. So that's what happened. So that was the Big Bang. And uh, the universe expanded super luminally, which means it expanded the, faster than the speed of light. So that's why it looks like an, expan uh, like an explosion. That's why this colloquial term Big Bang has been used for it. So because of the way the universe expanded, it means that every single place, every single location in the universe was once concentrated in that small little singularity or near singularity, which means that the Big Bang happened everywhere. Everything was part of the Big Bang. Where I am sitting right now, it was part of that initial extremely condensed, extremely small state. In, in, in which the universe existed. And wherever you're sitting right now, that was also part of it. We, what, what this means is that it is not incorrect in any way to say that the Big Bang happened everywhere. All of the space time that we have around us today, that we are inside, was part of this initial expansion of the universe. So the Big Bang basically was the entire universe. And therefore, it happened at all places at the same time. It happened here. It happened where you are. It happened where Jupiter is. It happened at the Andromeda galaxy. It happened in the farthest galaxy supercluster that we can observe, etc. Everything was part of it. So there is no actual direction. Everything was inside that little tiny, infinitesimally small point that was the uh, very early universe. So that's how it is. So I hope that answers your question. It clarifies your uh, question to some extent, hopefully. Avinash again asks the same, a different question. Why did the Big Bang take place? That's another very good question. So the best theory, like I said, that we have of the universe is the so-called Big Bang theory. Now, what does this theory say? First of all, what is this theory? 
this theory is a model of the history of the universe. This is the best theory that we have and it's a model of the history of our universe after the Big Bang occurred. It is not a theory of the creation of the universe. That's what we have to understand. There's a big difference. The Big Bang theory is not a theory of the creation of the universe. It is a model of the history of the universe after the Big Bang took place. And after the very early period of the universe's history, which we don't really understand very well. So around 10 raised to... Uh, see, so basically the universe had a birthday. The universe... There was a point in time, so to say before which there was no yesterday in the universe. So the universe emerged at a certain time, at a, well, at a certain time, you can say that, yeah. But before that, there was no time. So the universe had a birthday and everything proceeds further in a certain direction of time from that point onwards. So when the universe was about 10 raised to minus 36 seconds old, it was about the size of, of, a, of a tennis ball or cricket ball or an apple. So we begin to understand the Big Bang Theory essentially uh, begins to understand the universe from that point onwards. Because before that you had grand unification, which we don't quite understand. So before that point, basically all four forces that we know of in nature, the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, electromagnetism and gravitation, these were all of equal strengths. Gravity's role was much more uh, prominent at that time. Right? It was as strong as the other forces. And afterwards, the forces decouple into the in become similar to what we experience today. So our understanding of the old of the early universe proceeds forward from that point onwards, from 10 raised to minus 36 seconds onwards, and it's an approximate understanding of how things occurred. So basically, the Big Bang Theory is a model of what happened from that point onwards. It is. It doesn't seek to explain, it is not able to explain what caused the initial expansion itself. So you go, you go and ask any scientist, any theoretical physicist in the, in the world, they will not be able to answer why did the Big Bang take place, what caused it, what triggered the initial expansion of the universe, what triggered the creation of the universe. We don't know. So this, these are the limitations that we currently have in our understanding of the universe and, and, and in our understanding of science itself, of the laws of nature itself. So there's a great deal to understand. There's a great deal that we don't know. So that's what I keep emphasizing, that there is so much to... Uh, that's why physics, the and theoretical physics and physical cosmology and astrophysics, that's why it's so interesting, it's so fascinating, because there is so much still left to understand, so much still left to discover. The history of the very early universe is an especially fascinating uh, topic because it basically talks about grand unification, which is the so-called so-called holy grail of physics, the unification of the four four forces of nature and any others, if any others do exist. So, so basically, that's your answer. We do not know what triggered the Big Bang, what uh, laws or what what. Uh, forces or what it was that triggered this this event we don't know we only understand what happened after a certain point in the very early history of the universe and that too it's an approximate understanding there are still many uh, many many uh, data points that we don't have and many things we still don't understand but it, it is the best theory that we have as of now and it, it it does explain a lot about the universe and we do have a lot of evidence that supports this theory so that's your answer sir Avinash again asks, what is it like inside a black hole? So what we understand about black holes comes from the theory of general relativity. And this theory says that when you take a mass, any mass, and you compress it further and further, the effect it has on space-time becomes more and more acute. So if, if space-time is a sheet and a ball of mass produces, produces this distortion in the field, in the sheet, then the more condensed a mass is, the more, uh, the more dense a mass is, the greater it's going to stretch the fabric of space-time. And if you compress a mass sufficiently enough, 
so then it becomes equal to or less than its so called schwarzschild radius then it basically produces an infinite amount of uh, warping of this fabric of space time and that's what we call a black hole so the equations of general relativity einstein's equations they produce what's called a singularity which means it's division by zero it doesn't mean that there's an actual infinite density in there it actually means that our theory isn't able to handle that possible that that specific condition it means our theory isn't accurate enough it 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 shows up the limitations of the theory of general relativity it tells you that we need to be able to formulate a better theory we need to formulate a better theory one that takes into account account the the quantum uh domain of the universe so we basically need to find a way to reconcile quantum mechanics quantum field theory and general relativity which is something we haven't achieved thus far because if you try to quantize gravity it doesn't work it blow, it blows up it breaks down uh, you cannot have uh, space i mean you cannot have uh, quantum field theory doesn't work in curved space time etc so these are the, the problems that theoretical physicists are grappling with so essentially what i'm trying to say in so many words is we don't know what's inside a black hole a black hole is something that's it's a region of space time that's cut off completely from outside orbit of, from outside observers the boundary is what's called the event horizon and there is no way of knowing what's inside because everything that goes inside never comes out uh, except in the form of thermal radiation the so called hawking radiation which doesn't tell you anything about what's really inside the 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 black hole so what's inside a black hole we don't know there could be well there are speculations the it, a black hole be could possibly be a bag of single dimensional strings perhaps it could be something that contains just uh, radiation photons maybe it contains just pure mass that's another speculation or possibility some people say that a supermassive black hole could or any black hole could essentially be a pathway to a different universe it could end on the other side in a white hole and and bring you out in a different universe in which time flows backwards <laughs> and then it's it, it's also a possibility that supermassive black holes may contain entire universes inside them so these are speculations but we have no way of knowing first of all because we don't have access to a black hole on which we can do experiments because you know what black holes do they they suck everything in in so we don't have access to a black hole in a laboratory we don't have any a uh, black hole that anywhere nearby us that we uh, that we can observe and and get a be get better idea of and the theoretical framework that we have isn't able to explain uh, or answer these questions of what is the internal structure of a black hole we know that black holes have mass they have charge they have angular momentum and basically these are the three things that uh, characterize the properties of a black hole we don't know much beyond that so there is a great deal of research happening into the this very much into this this matter but as of today this is another example of the limitations of our understanding of nature we don't know what is the internal structure of a black hole we don't know what's inside we don't know what's beyond so it's a great question and these are the questions that drive physics forward abhi asks greeting from greetings from poland greetings greetings sir is it possible that all the things in the universe including our solar system earth and living non living things are all inside the brain of some other living being where we all live well that's interesting there's this uh, theory it's a it's a philosophical theory it's called uh, cosmopsychism which says that the universe is essentially conscious in itself which would indicate it's a brain of some kind and it's interesting that if you look at the large scale structure of the universe at the largest scales the filamentary structure of the universe where you have filaments of uh, which are made up of galaxy superclusters and these filaments connect the various uh, regions of the universe together if you look at the filamentary structure of the universe at the largest scales it is almost exactly the same as the neural structure of our brain yeah so so that is something that is very striking and it's something many people have noticed and commented about but the thing is that in our brain uh, signals 
travel at the speed of nearly at the speed of light the neural st- signals uh, not quite at the speed of light but these are electrical signals that that uh, are uh, transmitted between neurons and clusters via electrochemical processes using various ions and all that so these are biochemical processes that uh, transmit uh, what we interpret as our thoughts and various signals inside the brain so in the universe if the universe were a brain and it were if it were actually transmitting thoughts to various different regions then that transmission process is limited by the speed of light so it would typically take several million years from a, a signal to be transmitted from one location in this filament to another to a different location in the filament because that's how large these filaments are so that is one of the big uh, limitations in this theory that if it was a thinking brain then the thought process would be incredibly slow maybe the thought process was would be on the order of the uh, of the age of the universe or thereabouts because the universe is so vast maybe it's a very slow thinking brain or maybe there is something that circumvents this limit or and and bypasses the, this limit maybe there are actually wormholes in the universe that we don't know about and maybe these wormholes if maybe if they are made of cosmic strings possibly perhaps then maybe these wormholes are able to transmit thoughts faster than the, than the speed of light and transmit signals faster than the speed of light so this is this is all hypothetical it's all theoretical but but the large scale structure of the universe does very closely resemble the neural structure of the brain so it's an interesting thought uh, there is no evidence of this yeah it is a is it possible yeah possible but it's not a scientific theory because we don't have observational evidence of any signals being being transmitted right so it's a it's a theory which belongs in the realm of philosophy not science philosophy is something that's larger than science science is a small subset of philosophy so this is a philosophical theory until we find any evidence of this it is going to remain a philosophical theory if we do actually find some evidence then we can bring it into the realm of science and do some actual experimental uh, testing or or try and find some data some actual hard data about it so is it possible maybe it's possible it does uh, the structure of the universe does resemble the structure the internal structure of the human brain so it's it's very tantalizing it's a good question it's something even i have thought about in the past but as i said we don't have uh, sufficient or uh, or any credible data that supports this this claim as of today meenakshi asks why does every galaxy have a black hole at its center does this explain the theory that the universe is a hologram projected by hawking's radiation called carrying quantum data from the event horizon yeah okay so let me answer why does every galaxy have a black hole at its center you are right uh, most galaxies that we know of are known to have a supermassive black hole at their centers so how so why is it so how did this come about so it is uh, the the leading theory for this is that in the very early universe you had quantum fluctuations which are basically a feature of quantum field theory the entire uh, empty space is not empty it's teeming with quantum fluctuations particle anti particle pairs popping in and out of existence in a very short time frame etc so so in the early universe in the extremely early universe too you had this quantum fluctuations and the universe was so dense like i said at that time in the very early uh, phase that these quantum fluctuations would possibly have caused regions of spatial over densities which would call which would cause microscopic black holes to be formed so it is possible that the early universe saw the birth of an incredibly large amount and abundance of microscopic black holes and it is theorized that it is these microscopic black holes that were the seeds of future galaxies so as the universe expanded and cooled these black holes depending on the size remained uh, remained a, f- a feature of the universe that spread across the universe and it is around these black holes these micro black holes or primordial black holes that the first collections of matter began to form and these eventually became galaxies and over time these black holes absorbed a significant portion of the galactic mass and they slowly uh, 
became larger and eventually became supermassive in size. So that is the leading theory as of today as to why every galaxy has, almost every galaxy that we know of, has a supermassive black hole at the center. So these were possibly, see, uh, the, these probably originated as primordial black hole seeds, like small seeds that grow into something larger and larger over the eons, over the, over the billions of years of the universe's uh, lifespan. So that is a very, that is the leading theories of now. And these primordial black holes are a very interesting concept because they could possibly, possibly be part of a significant fraction of the dark matter of the universe. Dark matter is something we still don't have an answer to. So primordial black holes or primordial black hole binaries, for example, or some other configuration could possibly be a component of the missing dark matter of the universe. So it's a it's it's a theory that has a great deal of currency. Uh, people are searching for pri primordial black holes, but thus far we haven't found any evidence or signature of those black holes. People uh, people search for the uh, scientists are searching for the uh, Hawking radiation burst that a dying primordial black hole would give off. Thus far we haven't found it. It doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. These things don't exist. Maybe they exist in a different form. Maybe they have. Uh, Maybe they have formed binaries of some kind and they have become stable in some manner. We don't know as of now, but it's uh, it's one of the uh, one of the leading theories in in physics in the field of dark matter as well as 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 an explanation for these supermassive black holes that we find at the center of almost every galaxy we know of. So mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question. Okay, pink line. How how are space and time correlated with each other? I asked this to my physics teacher, but she replied that the question does not does not make any sense. Please clear this doubt. <laughs> well, it's unfortunate that your teacher said this. I will not make any pass any judgment about uh, your teacher, but this question makes a lot of sense. It does make a lot of sense. These are the questions that that basically help us understand physics better. These questions should be encouraged and these questions should be answered. This is an intelligent question, right? So as we know, we talk about space-time, the fabric of space-time. So what is space-time and how are space and time correlated? So the world that we observe in our daily life, in our mundane day-to-day -day existence is a three-dimensional world. We experience the world in three dimensions, length, breadth, and height, right? We don't think of time as a dimension, and we don't see any way in which it is related to the length, breadth, and height of the world that we uh, live in. And yet, according to general relativity, which is one of the most successful theories that we have, it actually works. So according to this theory, the universe is actually a four-dimensional stage in which everything exists. And time is the fourth dimension. It is intrinsically linked with the other three spatial dimensions. The three dimension of space and the one dimension of time are all linked together in this composite fabric of space-time. So the question, like you're saying, is what is the relation between time and space? How are they together? And let me answer that question. The easiest and, and simplest and best way to understand the correlation of time and space is to understand how matter affects time and space. So we know that matter warps space, right, in general relativity. And in the same way, matter affects time too. So if you look at the four-dimensional fabric of space-time as a sheet like, like everyone does, and if you place a massive ball or any massive object in it, it's going to warp this fabric. It warps not just space, but time too. So mass affects space and time equally. So what does it do in, in, in space? It warps space. And this warping of space is what we perceive as the force of gravity. And similarly, it changes the way time flows as well. So it is an effect on both space and time. So the presence of a mass essentially gives you the effect of slowing down time. If you're standing on the surface of the Earth, of the planet, Time flows at a certain speed. If you go up in a spacecraft, let's say 100 kilometers or 500 kilometers above the Earth, time will flow slightly, fractionally faster. We can actually measure this with very precise atomic clocks. So that's what is the 
correlation between space and time. Both are affected equally by the presence of mass. And the larger the mass, the more visible is the effect. So if we were to take a do an orbit around a black hole without being sucked into it and then if you were to move away you would find that a great deal of time has passed it may feel like half an hour for you but for an outside observer who is far away it may be 50 or 60 years or even a century so that the way time passes for you near a massive object is very different from the way time passes for somebody else who is far away from that massive object so this is the effect that mass has uh, or yeah mass has on space and time both and that is the correlation between space and time when you see it in the in the context of general relativity it is very hard to see this difference on a planet like like the earth because we only see the same reality all of us we are all stuck in this on the surface of a very small planet and we know nothing else it's only when you go beyond the planet into space or if you go near a massive object, which we still don't have access to, yeah. So it's only in those situations that you actually that you actually see the effect that gravity has on space and time both. So time would flow much slower if you go in an orbit around the sun, for example. Maybe it would cut off a few seconds, you know, or something like that. You, you can actually calculate these things with uh, the laws of laws of special relativity, right? So that is the correlation between space and time. That's the easiest way to express the correlation between space and time. They are part of the same fabric and they are both affected by the presence of mass. I hope that throws some light on the matter. I hope that inspires you to actually study general relativity and find out the actual mathematics that causes this. Because it is the mathematics that actually clarifies this. I'm just giving you, when you, when you communicate these these complex topics, it's uh, there is always some something that's lost in translation. The best way to un to understand this is to actually study the math. That is the language of physics, but that is uh, it's it's a labor of love because you have to learn that math. The math can be quite tough. The math of general relativity takes some time getting used to tensor calculus, ten tensor algebra, all that. But it is worthwhile if you if you really uh, have a passion for it. So I hope that answers your question at least. Uh, at least uh, at a, at a lay, lay person's perspective. Okay, Atishay asks, what actually is multiplication? It is not repeated, is it not repeated addition? And what does the multiplication in F equals M multiplied by A mean? Well, you are right, Atishai. Uh, multiplication is nothing but repeated addition. If we say 2 times 10 is 20, you're basically adding 2 10 times. So that is the simple thing about multiplication. It is nothing but repeated addition. That's how little children are taught. You start adding it together. And that's how you get uh, an intuitive understanding of what multiplication is. At least if you're, if you're teaching a child properly, then that's how you explain it to them. So it becomes intuitive. Uh, what does the multiplication in F equals M multiplied by A mean? So what this equation that you've shown over here, F equals MA, it is it expresses the Newton's second law of motion, right? It says, what it says is that the acceleration produced on a mass is proportional to the force that's, that's applied on the mass. And these are vector quantities. Acceleration has a direction and so does the force. Now, what is this? Is this multiplication? What is it? So let's break this equation down. F is, it represents force, M represents mass, A represents acceleration. Now, in this equation, M is a constant. Everybody has, in Newtonian physics, a constant mass. So this equation is basically to be understood in the context of a constant mass. And when you see M as a constant, this equation becomes an equation of proportionality. It says that mass and it, it says that acceleration and force are proportional to each other. And the proportionality is dependent on the amount of mass that a body has. Let's, let's break it down further. Let's say I have a mass. I have an object that has one kilogram of mass. It's, it, its mass is one kilogram. And let's say I apply a force to this object, which produces an acceleration of one meter per second squared. Okay. One kilogram mass 
and I apply a force to this object, which produces an acceleration of one meter per second square. So F equals one kilogram times one meter per second square, which is one Newton, which is the, which is the uh, unit of force. So if the mass was two, then F would be two Newtons. If the mass was 10 kilograms and I'm applying a force that causes an acceleration of one, of one meter per second square, then the force is 10 Newtons. So that is a proportionality. So this equation expresses the proportionality between force and acceleration and the resultant acceleration. So that's Newton's second law of motion. And uh, so it's a very good question. This is how you clarify these topics, right? This is this is proportionality and it's a vector proportionality. I will not go into what vectors are. Vectors are directional quantities. So acceleration is something that happens in a specific direction. It doesn't happen in all directions. And forces too, the resultant force on a body is usually, is, is always in one direction. Forces may come from, uh, the resultant force may be the sum total of many different forces, many di different directions, but the sum total is always in one specific direction. And that is the direction in which the acceleration also takes place. So I hope that clarifies and uh, you can study that further if you look up uh, Newton's second law of motion. Akash asks, is Elon Musk capable of nuking the poles of Mars? Is it a good idea? So I think he has been saying this, let's nuke Mars, let's nuke Mars. I think he is saying this in a humorous uh, vein. Uh, I don't think I don't think he's serious about it. It's just a joke. Uh, is he capable of nuking Mars? He doesn't have access to nuclear weapons. No civilian on this planet has access to nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons are closely guarded. They are guarded very closely and with a great deal of military security, right? These are the most dangerous weapons that we have. So this is something only government officials and military personnel have access to, and that too at the highest level. So Elon Musk is not capable of nuking the poles of Mars. He doesn't have access to nuclear weapons. If he can convince people, with governments to do it, then maybe it can happen. But I think he's just being, being humorous. He's just making a joke. I don't think it's a good idea because of the radiation fallout. If you... What what would uh, nuking the poles of Mars achieve? It would uh, basically cause the ice on the poles to melt. And if you uh, basically produce a sufficient quantity of heat from these nuclear explosions, then you could basically uh, recreate a sort of wet environment on Mars, or on Mars, which could perhaps trigger back a spurt of growth of life and it could change the atmosphere etc so it's basically a, a quick and dirty way of terraforming the planet it is not a good idea because of the radiation fallout which would basically contaminate the whole planet and the entire atmosphere because you would need a great deal of nuclear uh, energy of, of uh, you would need a great number of nuclear bombs in order to achieve that that result of making the whole planet wet again and and, and of melting the entire quantum of ice on the two poles. So it's not a good idea. That's not the way to do, do this, do the terraforming of any planet. It would have, it's it's something that you that you can't really control, right? It would have lots of unintended consequences. You can game it all and you can uh, fi basically predict roughly what the effect would be. But if you, if humanity is serious about making Mars a second home in the long term future, then nuking the planet is definitely not a good a good idea, a good, good way of doing that. So I think it's just humor, but it's not a good idea. So a related question by Akash, uh, can we really terraform Mars? How are we going to get oxygen, water, plants, and the ecosystem in a desolate place like that? And how can we survive the cosmic radiation without any ozone layer and an atmosphere? Very good questions. So let's understand what Mars is like. Mars is a smaller planet. Its diameter is maybe half that of the Earth. Its gravity is about 38% of the Earth. So if somebody weighs 100 kilograms on Earth, they would weigh 38 kilograms on Mars. The atmosphere is basically one hundredth that of the Earth, uh, roughly. Yeah, Mars doesn't have a magnetic field, which means that there is there is no way to stop the cosmic rays and the solar wind 
from bombarding the planet, which means that it would be a very hazardous play, place for uh, for humans to be in. It would basically expose you to a great deal of of solar and cosmic radiation, which is very detrimental to human life, right? And yeah, there's the atmosphere is very tenuous compared to that of the Earth. There is no ozone layer, etc. So how do you terraform a planet like that? Firstly, let's understand that in order to terraform a planet, you need to be approximately at Kardashev type 1 civilization, which we are not. We are nowhere near being a Kardashev type 1 civilization. We are not able to terraform our own planet. We are not in control of the climate change. We are not able to stop that or prevent that. We are not able to stop the pollution of our oceans and so on and so forth. So we are not in control of what's happening on the planet, on our own home planet. Uh, it's an out of control reaction uh, uh, or process. So we are nowhere near being a Kardashev type 1 civilization. And in order to terraform a different planet, we would need that technological capability. So assuming hypothetically that in the future we start reaching that stage, maybe 0 0.8, 0 0.9 Kardashev on, on the Kardashev scale, then how would we go about terraforming a planet like Mars? The first thing is we need to give it a good amount of atmosphere and uh, an atmosphere that's that's comparable to that of our planet here we want the right mix of gases as well we, we need oxygen first of all we also need a uh, gas like nitrogen so we need to uh, give mars an atmosphere similar to that of the earth so it would have to be a hundred times uh, denser uh, more 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 voluminous than the atmosphere that we have in mars right now and we would need, see right now the temperature in Mars is about minus 60 or something degrees Celsius, which is too cold for, for life as we know it. it. Some kind of life can survive in that temperature, but it's not ideal for human beings. The average temperature on Earth is about, I don't know, 14, 20, something like that degrees Celsius centigrade. So we want the temperature to go above zero at least, yeah. So we need to bring about a, a number of changes there. We can't do anything about the gravity of the planet, which is about a third of what we have here, but we can change the other aspects and parameters of the planet. So one way of, of warming the planet is to uh, surround the planet with orbiting mirrors that would focus more of the solar uh, light and radiation on the surface of the planet. And that would heat up the planet considerably. And we can, depending on the number of mirrors and the and the surface area, total surface area of the of the mirrors, we can basically, if we are able to achieve that technology, then we can possibly control and and the and determine what is the specific temperature we want to achieve on the planet. So that is one idea: orbiting mirrors around the planet, maybe a ring or several rings of mirrors, or mirrors in a hemispherical shape, or any such or the best optimized shape to achieve the desired effect. So for that, we would need to build and create the technology. We still don't have the technology to do that. But hypothetically, theoretically, it's definitely possible. So that is one way to warm the planet. Warming the planet would basically reachieve um, the state of running water because we know there's plenty of water on Mars. Below the surface, it's all frozen. There is a little bit of running water from time to time that, we, that is observed. And there's a great deal of water at the poles on the surface. So by warming the planet, you would make it a wet planet. And then you would do certain things to, uh, to create a gaseous atmosphere as well. So there are a number of tactics you can use. And then how do you get oxygen water plants? You would need certain kinds of chemical reactions. There's a lot of carbon dioxide on Mars. If you grow plants there, they would release oxygen. And over the long term, over the long run, maybe you would be able to produce oxygen there. That's one idea. The problem, one of the problems is that the soil of Mars is reasonably toxic. It contains certain perchlorates and other chemicals that are not, that are toxic to life, even uh, plant life. So that is another problem that we would have to overcome. So there's a lot of challenges right now that we have. We would have to address each of these issues one by one. And only when all these issues are addressed will, be, will we be able to terraform the planet and make it live, livable for humanity in the long run. In some, in some ways, we can make it similar to Earth.
So this is all in the realm of science fiction today. We don't have anything near the technology as of today. We can't even reach Mars as, as of as of today. Maybe in a decade's time or so. We do have the technology now to send people there, but we need to be able to send them and bring them back safely. Right now, there's a reasonable amount of risk involved. So this is all in the future, maybe a hundred years from today or or approximately something like that. But it is possible. It's definitely possible. A number of challenges need to be overcome, but these are potentially problems that we can actually solve as the as our technological capabilities evolve and as we come closer to the status of a type one civilization. Okay, Minakshi asks, what does borrowing energy from space-time mean? So this is in the context of quantum field theory. Quantum field theory says that the entire world is an illusion, whatever we see. The entire world is made up of fields and particles themselves are local manifestations, local manifestations of these fields. So you have 17 different fields that permeate the universe. It's just one field across the entire universe and particles are local uh, manifestations of these fields. And it also says that the uh, vacuum of space itself is an illusion. It is full of uh, uh, it's full of uh, particle and particle pairs that are coming in and out of existence at all times. So it's extremely energetic, right? So it is in this context that one talks about the uh, this idea of borrowing energy from space time. So what it means is that uh, the vacuum of space is teeming with particle and antiparticle pairs. So a particle and antiparticle pair is formed out of the vacuum of space time and it is formed and it very quickly uh, annihilates itself. So it gives the energy back to space time. So isn't this something that violates the conservation of energy, right? That's the question. Because uh, you can't just borrow energy from nowhere. En energy has to be, the, the conservation of energy has to be uh, respected. So there is one loophole called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So uh, there is one formulation of this principle that is the energy time formulation. It basically says that energy, uh, the uncertainty in energy and the uncertainty in time are inversely proportional to each other. So the greater the uncertainty in energy, the, sh the smaller is the uncertainty in time and the greater the uncertainty in time, the smaller the uncertainty in energy, which essentially I know it sounds like gobbledygook, but it essentially tells you that you can borrow energy from vacuum as long as you give it back within the time frame, the time window that Heisenberg's uncertainty principle gives you. So that's what happens. These are all virtual particle antiparticle pairs. These are these are these form and annihilate each other too quickly to be actually observed but you can observe their indirect effects and these experiments have been done. So it actually is true. There are such particle antiparticle pairs being formed and destroyed all the time in vacuum. So basically you're borrowing energy from the vacuum and giving it back within the time window that is that, that Heisenberg uncertainty, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle gives you. And that is a loophole that is exploited, that, that nature exploits in this manner. So you take energy and you give it back in a very short period of time before you violate the uncertainty principle. That's all it is, basically. That's the best way to look at it. So that's how vacuum itself has a great deal of energy and it, it's, it's teeming with particle antiparticle pairs and that is one of the things that we find in quantum field theory which is the most successful theory of the ultra microscopic universe that we have as of today lena asks what is the fermi paradox the Fer the fermi paradox can be stated in one single sentence where are all aliens so the thing is, uh, the universe is immense. We have uh, maybe maybe a trillion galaxies or a hundred billion galaxies or something like that, approximately. And, and if our home galaxy, the Milky Way, is a typical galaxy, then it has, has approximately a hundred billion stars, right? And we now know that most stars have planets, so-called exoplanets. We have found 
exoplanets in most of the stars that we have been studying. So it looks like planets are very common. And if we total, if we add up the number of stars in the universe, it's a, it's a very, very large number. A trillion multiplied by a hundred billion. A trillion is, uh, if you multiply a hundred billion, which has 14 zeros, a billion has nine zeros, right? Million, billion. Yeah, so it's 11 zeros times 11 zeros. That's 22 zeros. And if each star has just one planet, then you have 10 raised to 22 planets. One with 22 zeros behind it in the entire universe. That's the number of planets you have. Now, let's say 0.1% of them are in the habitable zone of their stars where water can be uh, can flow as a liquid. Then still you have 10 raised to 20 or so planets in the habitable zone. So there are so many planets out there in the universe, in the habitable zone, then there should be, then there should be intelligent life out there. It should be pretty common, right? And, and yet we don't see any signs of intelligent life in the world. We have never detected any transmission or any, any telltale sign, telltale sign that indicates that some, something artificial is at work there. Something that indicates uh, an intelligence an intelligent, intelligent life behind it. So we have thus far found no signal that is unequivocally proven to be a signal from a different civilization. And therefore it appears to us that we are all alone in the universe as an intelligent life form, as an intelligent species. And even if there is microscopic or microbial life out there, it doesn't look like there is any intelligent life out there. So that is the paradox. Even though there are so many galaxies, so many stars, so many planets, and yet we don't find any evidence of intelligent life. There is not one signal we have received. That is the Fermi paradox. And uh, there are a number of theories that seek to explain why it is so. Maybe space is so vast that it is difficult to find signals from other species. Maybe intelligent life is more intelligent than us and it doesn't want to be found. Maybe it doesn't just beam out signals into space in all directions. Maybe it conserves its en its energy and uses energy very effect effectively, efficiently, so that there are no wasted transmissions. That's another possibility. Or maybe it's so advanced we, we don't even know how to detect it. So these are possibilities. Or maybe we are truly alone in the universe, which is frightening to some people. Well, so, so these are various possibilities. These are various theories and speculations. We still don't know what is, uh, what really is out there. Is there intelligent life, or are we truly alone? So, so that is the paradox. Where are all the intelligent aliens, right? So, as of today, we don't have answers. We are still seeking answers. We have these radio telescopes and the SETI SETI project that that seeks that listens to the universe for signs of some intelligent life, etc. I think as our technology gets better and better, we will, we will, I think we'll get a better understanding of what really is out there. There are some people who believe that we will make our first contact with intelligent alien civilizations within this century. Some people believe they're already here. So as of today, we don't know. There is no evidence, 100% uh, uh, proven evidence. So that is a paradox. Where are all the aliens? Okay, Gaurangi asks, can you put a light on the properties of WIMPs, weakly interactive, interacting massive particles? So the WIMP is a, one of the possible proposed solutions to the dark matter problem. A weakly interacting massive particle is a hypothetical particle that uh, interacts via gravity and via either the weak nuclear force or some other weak force that we don't know of. So that's what it is. It's a hypothetical particle. It's been proposed to try and solve the question of what is dark matter. So there are models in which you have WIMPs, clouds of WIMPs, halos of WIMPs, or or maybe WIMPs that uh, that permeate the world, and we still don't don't we are not able to detect them. So it's one of the class of hypothetical objects that seeks to, uh, hypothetical particles that seeks to uh, try and answer the riddle of what dark matter is. So there, there is a whole bunch of uh, theories and, and proposed particles, some exotic, some not so exotic, that uh, try to account for what dark matter is. As of today, we have 
no idea what dark matter is and uh, the wimp theory is one of the mainstream theories but it's still like all other theories not proven there are wimps there are axions there are uh, machos and, and many other such particles maybe uh, black holes pri- primordial black holes or primordial black hole binaries or even neutrinos could be anything as of today we don't know what it is it's mostly most likely cold dark matter which means it doesn't it's it's slow moving dark matter but it's the so the wimp is one of these hypothetical particles that has been proposed to try and solve the riddle of dark matter it's a hypothetical particle it's never been observed we have no experimental evidence or detection of these particles but it's still one of the theories that is taken seriously and uh, it's one of a number of theories that is taken seriously in the hunt for dark matter sumit asks please explain something about the dark side of the moon so the earth and the moon are tidally locked which means that they rotate in such a manner that we can only see the same side of the moon at all times we can never see the other t- other side of the moon it was not so in the past in the past the two planets were the, the the planet and the moon were rotating at different speeds but over time they got tidally locked that's what happens uh and so we see only one side of the moon and therefore for the entirety of our existence as a species the past 2 3 million years we have only seen one side of our moon and we we have always been wondering what's on the other side if there's any so in the past people did not know that the moon is is spherical but once we realized it is spherical we were all curious about what is on the other side so the other side is now well known we have taken photographs we have spent space, sent spacecraft in orbit around the moon and uh, there are very good high resolution images of the other side of the moon it's different from what we see on the near side of the moon there are different craters but it's more or less the same kind of surface so there is nothing special about the other side it's just that we don't get to see it but now you can look it up online you will see photographs of the dark side so uh one of the things good one of the interesting things about the dark side is if if you are on the far side of the moon then it is a place where you have absolutely complete radio silence if you are on the near side of the moon you are inundated with radio signals and other transmissions from the earth we are an extremely noisy species our transmissions go out in all directions in space we are not efficient enough to conserve those trans- transmissions and direct them only on the planet on the surface of the planet so the earth's uh, surrounding area is a very noisy region lots of it's you're con- constantly bombarded with radio transmissions and other transmissions throughout the electromagnetic spectrum all originating from human activity on the surface of the planet so if you are on the far side of the moon you are shielded from that and therefore it's a great place to do astrophysical experiments it's a great place for uh, for for ex- for example searching for extraterrestrial radio transmissions and for doing other experiments which would not be disturbed by the electromagnetic noise that is emanating from our planet so that's why it's a great place on which to keep on, on which to place scientific ex- uh, instrumentation and do various experiments so that is one of the interesting things about the about the far side of the moon it's not dark it's just far it also receives as much sunlight as the side that we do see so it's not dark it's just that it's one of the popular ways of of uh, of terming it so it's the far side of the moon and uh, recently uh, the, the chinese have have sent a robotic spacecraft over there a robotic lander it's still active as as we speak right now and hopefully india also sends something there once we get our chandrayaan 3 program moving the chandrayaan 3 program will be targeting the south pole region of the moon on the near side but eventually i hope we become ambitious enough to send future spacecraft on the far side and get our own images and other things from that from that side of the moon so that's all it is it's nothing special it's just the side that we don't see but it's very much like the near side the only special thing is that there is complete silence on the electromagnetic spectrum as of today okay next question 
Akash asks, is there a limit to technology? Could there be some day uh, where we can't proceed further beyond a certain point because of the laws of the universe? Yes, there are things that the laws of the universe don't allow and therefore we cannot violate those. Those are just hard-coded in the universe. You simply can't uh, you simply can't violate the fundamental laws of the, of the universe. The actual limit to technology is our own intelligence limit, right? We as a species have a certain maximum intelligence and we simply can't go beyond that. And therefore, because of the limit of our intelligence, there will be certain things that we will most likely never understand until we evolve further and possibly become more intelligent than what we are today. So we tend to think of ourselves as the most intelligent thing in the universe and therefore we can understand everything. I think on the larger scale of the of the universe, there could be possibly other beings, other civilizations, other species on other stars, galaxies, who would be who could possibly be way more intelligent than, than us. And the the intelligence, um, the the way to see the difference in intelligence would be the way we see a dog or a cat, you know, or maybe an insect. I mean, there's no comparison of the kind of intelligence we have compared to the kind of intelligence a butterfly has, right? So there could possibly be such uh, civilizations and species who are so intelligent that we are essentially like butterflies to them. And therefore their understanding of the universe would be sig- many orders of magnitude better than ours. And therefore the technology, the, the kind of technology they develop, they would be able to develop, would be far beyond anything we can even imagine. So I think the real limit to technology is the limit of our intelligence. It's not the laws of the, of the universe. Of course, the laws of the universe will not allow you to do magic, you know. <laughs> so yeah, there are things that the universe doesn't allow you to do. But the real limit to technology is the human intelligence and the limits of human intelligence itself. So I think that is the real limit and that's why we cannot proceed beyond a certain point. Definitely there is a point beyond humanity, even if, if it achieves its full potential today, it still can't go beyond a certain point. And it is not because of the laws of the universe, it's because of our own limitations of our intelligence. Okay, Gorangi asks, why are we trying to set up colonies on Mars? Why not the moon, which is much closer, as you say? Or is terraforming the moon more difficult than Mars? Well, that's a very good question. I th- I'm sure lots of people have this question because the moon is right next door. We can go there in like a couple of days, less than a week's time. We can reach there with the current technology that we have. Uh, so, yeah, good question. Why don't we terraform the moon? The thing is this, uh, when you are talking about moving to a different location, to a different planet, you want it to be as close to the earth, not as close, but as much earth-like as possible. So you want it to be similar in size. You want it to have a similar kind of atmosphere to start off with. So before you terraform a planet, you look at a number of candidates and you take the one that is the closest in, in, in its nature and appearance to the earth. So it should be similar sized and all that. So the closest candidate we have is Mars. Actually, Venus is almost the same size as the earth, right? But its atmosphere is is an absolute hell. It's about 300 times uh, larger, greater than the earth. The atmospheric pressure is, I think, 300 times or so greater than what we have on the earth. And the atmospheric composition is absolute hell. You have uh, sulfur dioxide, uh, sulfuric acid rain, and uh, <laughs> and lightning and thunder and all that, right? So it's a terrible place to even think of settling in. And it's almost impossible to terraform. Mars, on the other hand, even though it's smaller than our planet, has certain conditions that are similar to that of Earth. For example, it, its day is about 24 hours long. It did have running water, liquid water in the past. It may even have had life in the past. And it's uh, the temperature is low, of course, but those things can be changed. The moon, on the other hand, doesn't have an atmosphere at all. Its gravity is about one-sixth of that of the Earth. So if you weigh 100 kilos on Earth, you would weigh one-sixth of that on the moon. And that is not a good, uh, it's not conducive to human health, you know. 
we need gravity to in order to remain healthy people who go out in space and spend a year in orbit they essentially become extremely weak their bones become more brittle uh, and there are effects on the cardiovascular system and all that which are which so basically lower gravity is not good for human health and therefore mars is a much better candidate from that perspective than the moon because its gravity is about 38% of that of the earth and it already has an atmosphere which we can augment hopefully the moon doesn't have an atmosphere it does have a very tenuous wispy quasi atmosphere which is basically almost the same as vacuum so that uh, these are the reasons why uh, mars is a better candidate even the soil of the moon is is not uh, it's it's quite i don't think it's very conducive to growing plants and all that so the main reason is the moon is too small its gravity is too weak secondly it doesn't have an atmosphere it is almost impossible it, it is completely impossible to give it an, a, an artificial atmosphere because its gravity gravity is so weak then even if you give it an artificial atmosphere the atmosphere will slowly leak away in in a reasonably short period of time so it has to be a massive planet more massive than the moon and these are the reasons why the mars is a much better candidate for terraforming and for long term future human habitation than the moon even though the moon is so close by so these are the reasons why we prefer why everyone prefers mars as opposed to the moon right i think that's the end of all the all these questions so let me take a look at what questions you are asking me and i'll take a few live chat questions one of the reasons for not forming colonies on the moon moon has no atmosphere yes correct that's uh, yeah i agree that's what i was saying good question if singularities and mathematical equations are considered to be yeah in, incomplete me it means that the theory isn't correct is it entirely correct so is it possible that the big bang didn't start from a singularity and if yes then why do we say it started from it we say the big bang started from a singularity because that's what general relativity tells us right but like you said singularities like you point out over here singularities are essentially a flaw in the equations it's not a real singularity it uh, a singularity in in your theory indicates that the theory is not complete there is something you need to do further which will reveal better and more complete laws of of nature and therefore yes it is possible indeed that the big bang didn't start from a singularity maybe there was something else maybe there was a big bounce so there is this theory called loop quantum gravity which says that in which in this theory in loop quantum gravity space time itself is quantized and the minimum volume of space time is 10 to the minus 99 cubic uh cubic meter so yeah in that case the universe would not have had a big bang it would have had a big bounce so the minimum volume possible is 10 to the minus 99 cubic meters or cent- cubic centimeters yeah so so in so in this theory yes the big bang did not start from a singularity it started started from that minimum minimum quantum of volume of space time so yeah like you're saying it, it is very much uh, possible we need to find a better theory we need to uh, improve the theory of general relativity and hopefully quantize it and uh, find the true quantum theory of gravitation in which case we most likely won't have singularities and we will have a better understanding of what the so called big bang was like so that's a great question okay sagar asks will i be wrong if i say something is a non living thing because at the atomic level everything may is made of chemi- chemical compositions and if yes then please comment about consciousness so at the atomic level everything is atoms molecules electrons protons neutrons all that subatomic level 
So everything is atoms and at the higher level, molecular level, you have chemicals. And then you have biochemistry, the biochemistry of life. You have carbon compounds. You have amino acids that are the, that are the building blocks of life, etc. So we don't exactly have a clear definition of the boundary between living and non-living, right? So biochemistry is all about the chemistry of life. Life seems to emerge out of complex chemistry. The kind of life we have on our planet emerges out of the biochemistry of carbon compounds. So it is believed that uh, life emerged in the primordial earth because of the kind of conditions we had on the planet and the kind of chemical uh, composition we had on the chem on the planet but we don't exactly know what is the dividing life between non-living and living most likely living is a unicellular organism uh, with a single cell maybe a nucleus within it and maybe dna in the nucleus so we don't have a clear definition of the dividing line between living and non-living so uh so since we don't have a clear definition, we can't really say what is living, what, what is non-living. We know that we are living. We know that all life on planet is living. When we see life, we can say, yeah, this is life. But there are certain things that are on the dividing line between living and non-living beings. For example, viruses. Viruses exhibit properties that are of living beings. They also exhibit properties that are of non-living uh, substances. So viruses are 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 on the dividing line. They do have DNA, they do replicate, but they don't, uh, there are certain things that like, they don't uh, react to the environment. They don't uh, maintain a certain kind of uh, composition within, within their living cells and all that. So there are, uh, there are certain things about viruses that categorize them between the living and non-living boundary. So, so it's a good question, and it's a question that's a, a matter of debate right now. At the atomic level, there is no life, of course. At the, at the chemical molecular level, it's all chemistry. There is no life. It's only when you talk about biochemistry, the chemistry that occurs within living beings, that you're talking about life to some extent. So is everything a non-living thing? No, we have life, but we also have atoms. We also have chemicals. So you're talking about classification and nomenclature, essentially. That's the question. That's what the question is. So it's it's kind of vague. That's where that's why biology and chemistry, biology especially, is not a very exact science. The only exact science is physics. Chemistry emerges out of physics, and biology emerges out of chemistry. So you are talking in terms of more accurate uh, representations of nature when you only talk about physics. Chemistry is also reasonably accurate. Biology is a little little vague. So it would not be correct to say that everything is non-living. We are made up of non-living components, but there is definitely life within us. And we don't have a very clear definition of life. About consciousness, well, consciousness is another big mystery. It's one of, one of the mysteries that is now closely tied to the quantum world because consciousness seems possibly to have some kind of role to play in the observer effect and in manifesting certain things and all that, right? So we don't have a clear definition of consciousness. We don't have the vaguest definition of what consciousness is. All we can say is that we are conscious and other living beings are conscious. But we don't have a definition, a proper, unambiguous, scientific definition of what consciousness is. So that's another matter of great debate right now. It is now Consciousness is now beginning to enter the realm of science. Until now, it's been in the realm of philosophy and spirituality, which is separate from science. It is not scientific. But today, because of quantum mechanics, we are increasingly trying to understand the phenomenon of consciousness. Is it an emergent phenomenon or is it something else? Uh, many scientists would tell you that that that. Uh, Consciousness emerges out of the chemical, out of the biochemical reactions within the brain. So that is one possibility. Other scientists would strongly disagree with that. So as of now, until we can clearly define consciousness, we can't really start having a proper scientific discussion about this. So it's a matter of great discussion and debate right now, but it's not firmly entered the realm of science. It's still quite hazy and vague. So, good question, sir.
Okay, Akashic Records. So I don't know what Akashic Records are. This is something in the realm of spirituality. We're talking about science today. I am not saying, I'm not trying to make fun of spirituality. I am not discounting spirituality or philosophy. I'm just saying these are separate things. Okay, so a scientist, what is science? And what is the difference between science and philosophy or science and spirituality? We have to understand this clearly. Science deals with the observable universe and material objects. Only that. That is the firm limitation of science. Only material objects and only the observable universe. Nothing beyond that. So that is science. That's what it deals with. Philosophy deals with the material universe and observable objects, but it also deals with non-observable objects and phenomena. It deals with things like right and wrong. It deals with questions of morality and ethics and of non-physical objects like the soul and consciousness, right? So these are things that are non-observable, non-physical. By definition, the soul is non-physical. It's non-observable, right? We can't see it. We can't measure it. Therefore, it is in the realm of philosophy, not in the realm of science. It doesn't mean it may not exist. But as a scientist, I can't see it. I can't detect it. I can't measure it. And therefore, I will not talk about it. That's what is the attitude of scientists as it should be. Although if you start mixing things up, then you're no longer in one place or the other. And similarly, the Akashic Records is something that is in the realm of spirituality, which is again a higher, it's, it's again something that is that is something similar to philosophy. I think I'll have to do a separate session in which I, I uh, define these things very clearly. I will do that. But once again, spirituality is not part of science, right? So you can't say that because it is there in spirituality, that spirituality therefore it should be scientifically valid. No. Science only deals with physical objects and observable phenomena. That's all it is. That is a limitation of science. It doesn't mean these th other things don't exist. It doesn't mean we should make fun of them. Maybe they do exist and maybe our science isn't evolved enough. Like I have been emphasizing repeatedly, we know very little about the universe. Our science is very rudimentary. We don't know about how the universe started. We don't know what created the universe what impelled the so-called Big Bang. We don't know so many things. 95% of the universe is dark. Therefore, science has a great deal of limitations. Our understanding of science is, is even more limited. And therefore, if one were to evolve and become more intelligent in the future, then maybe some of the things that we speak about in spirituality and in ph in philosophy may in the future, possibly, perhaps, someday, come into the realm of science if we can observe and quantify and measure these phenomena. As of today, it is spirituality, it is philosophy, it is not science, and therefore philosophical and spiritual uh, concepts cannot give us answers in the physical world, in the realm of the physical sciences. So I hope that clarifies the difference between science and philosophy. I think it is wrong for scientists to make fun of spirituality or philosophy. That is that is the sign of a of a narrow and closed mind. But as a scientist, you have to deal with the physical and observable universe only. And many scientists have spiritual and philosophical opinions and beliefs. But as a scientist, you don't write papers on spirituality and physics. You write papers on science only. So I hope that clarifies this matter. Okay, one more question. Okay, so after a person died, six grams or something like that, body loses weight. My thoughts, well, when a person dies, when any any living being dies, dies their physical nature changes. The biochemical processes, processes that sustain life stop. They, they may lose some, some, some water mass in the form of gas. And many changes happen in the body. So yes, the weight will change within a few hours maybe within a few minutes, etc. It indicates a complete change in the biochemistry of that physical body. That's all it indicates. It doesn't mean anything else. Some people try to say that the soul has left the body and that's why the body is lighter. Well, where is the evidence? Show me the soul that left the body. 
I am not saying there is no soul. There may be a soul. However, it is not physically measurable or quantifiable. If there is a loss in the weight of a body, a change in the weight of the body, it can be very easily explained by the altered biochemistry of that physical body. And therefore, it does not prove the existence of a soul. I am not saying again that it means the soul doesn't exist. I am not of that opinion. I am saying that it is a matter of philosophy and spirituality. It's not a matter of physics and science. I I hope that uh, helps you better understand the difference between science and philosophy. Both are valid, valid uh, and uh, and important aspects of the intellectual pursuits of humanity. But these are separate aspects. You, we cannot start merging the two. Shall I take one more? Okay, let me take one final question. What is the relationship between Area 51 and aliens? Well, we don't know. It's a secret location. Nobody is ever allowed inside, right? The media isn't allowed inside. Civilians aren't allowed inside. Uh, It's a very highly secure location. It's where the US military essentially carries out tests of secret futuristic technology. Technology that is not revealed for many decades. And that's why people believe that aliens, uh, there is some alien connection or something. Maybe there are some alien spacecraft, etc. that are being tested over there. Is it possible? Well, it's not impossible. I cannot prove it's not happening. So maybe it's happening. But I think the probability is, is on the lower side that there is actual alien technology there. But I'm not discounting the possibility. But as you know, I don't have proof. My opinion is there is a small possibility that maybe there is something like that. But most likely, it's just a highly secure and secret location where the latest technology is being developed. And when they fly these futuristic aircraft in the night sky, it may look like alien spacecraft because you don't know what actually it is, right? So when they were testing the uh, so-called stealth bomber, that bomber has a very alien shape, doesn't it? It's a flying wing design. And if somebody sees it in the night sky with lights lights on, it would look very much like an alien spacecraft. So that's why, that's one of the possible reasons why it is associated with aliens and all that. And there are persistent claims that they have alien technology there, etc. So I think maybe, maybe it's possible. I don't have evidence. I have an open mind. So I think maybe it's true. Right, my friends. Uh, This brings us to an end for this session. Great questions. Keep them coming. We're going to do it again next week. So thank you all for participating. Thank you for listening, watching. And I will see you in the next session. Thank you very much. Good night. Good day. Bye.